Okay, so a few updates, and uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to, since Ruslan, if you're on on board today, I don't know if you've been following the the DIN specification for Germany for open source. I don't know if you know a little bit more about it, but maybe you can um, feedback on that. Um, Ruslan, do you do you know anything about that? Have you been following that motion there? Uh, what do you mean? Um Open source had run, had run, specification by, wait, uh, it's uh, too much echo. Uh, let, me, let me see about this echo here. Let's see if I can put on these headphones. Okay, go ahead. Speak. So, sorry, I need to do what on headset. Otherwise, I have a good sound. No, my phones aren't really working. I can mute myself if you want. Um, maybe if you want to <clears throat> report to us, and I can mute myself here. Can you do that? Uh, about uh, the norm, uh, I don't know now the current state, but I, I can find out. And uh, prepare something next time. Yeah. You know, uh, there is a lot of progress there. We got uh, some official support from uh, from DIN. Yeah. Yeah. And just so DIN specification for open source hardware in Germany that's happening right now. Uh, yes. Is the idea that mm, there are some standards that are put into the German standards organization such that when any company is making something that complies with such standards, they can put, okay, D DIN something which corresponds to the open source hardware specification, uh, which gives clarity and mm, I guess clarity as far as the requirements that something follows with with respect to its openness so is that is that the general idea i think the general idea is um, uh, more general uh, what but is it? I, I, I fear that i will not be able now to uh, to precisely describe uh, the current states and the main idea because i am not prepared and uh, there are some um, it, There are some, um, it's a pretty complex topic, uh, probably, I think it's better I will prepare the results or even better if I will have some of the people who, someone who actually actively um, develop this standard yeah. for the next, and then we can get more information. The most important thing is there is, uh, there is a lot of progress there, and we uh, got official support. Yeah. When is that process supposed to finish? Do you know by any chance? Uh, no, I, uh, I okay. didn't uh, look, look there for, for many months, and now I have no uh, up-to-date information. Yeah. But I hope it will change soon. soon. Yeah. Yeah, so when, when that process goes through, uh, also as a model for maybe inserting the open source specifications into other codes, other standards organizations on an international level, that would be something to look at. Uh, so yeah, we can get a report later on. So if if you could maybe, um, like one, in the future, once that wraps up, what we should do is we should invite, I think it was Martin who, who was heading that, and um, we should have him report on what's, what's the latest and greatest on that. Okay.
Yes, Sounds good. for sure it will be very interesting. Uh, he can explain uh, more in details uh, what, is, what are the core ideas and what are, is the current status of, of the project. Yeah, yeah, and also what motivated him to, to take that on. Uh, is it that he's also working on some open hardware projects, I would assume? Clearly, right? Uh, you know, in open source ecology in Germany, we, yeah. uh, we develop uh, now many uh, open source hardware projects. Was, do you know if the motivation for the specification was, was regarding taking some of them to market or like, uh, was there any particular incentive? Like why, why that hap why that is happening now or it just happened? Uh, um, I, I, I think I cannot answer yeah. um, okay. this, uh, this questions because I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we, in the very, in the very beginning, we took an account uh, that uh, the possibility that uh, one of the possible use of open source hardware is for uh, commercial purpose. But now I don't know the topics. Uh, I don't know the status now. But at the very beginning, uh, I made some comments about uh, non-commercial use, um, which. Uh, is one of the problem on obstacles in uh, with Creative Commons and license. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, there are also uh, other projects uh, uh, which we do uh, cooperate, and they uh, they try to make uh, open source hardware um, business. Yeah. There, there are many possibilities uh, and also research and uh, um, other possibilities. Okay. All right. That sounds good. So let's, uh, I'll continue a bit here then uh, with this. So <clears throat> main updates is on my side is you can say production engineering on a 3D printer. So um, let's see, take a look at the third page. Um, production engineering means that uh, right now, a very specific task is, is how do you open source the production engineering, i.e. make it replicable for 12 3D printer builds in a single day in a framework of a kit operation. So saying we're going to ship kits, like if you want to start a business shipping kits, what exactly do you need to do to make that happen to certain quality control standards uh, in a rapid time frame? So that's the extreme manufacturing slash extreme enterprise model. Uh, key things there are electronic, I would say, I mean, one is mechanical, the other one is electronic. There's tricks in the, on each side. On the mechanical side, there's things to pay attention to. to. On the electronic side, it's it's more about parts actually functioning, making sure that when you put them all together, the whole system works because there might be faulty parts. And well, mechanical things are typically easier to fix because you might have to mechanically uh, do some operation that that fixes any kind of issue. But electronically speaking, if a part is bad, it's really hard to diagnose or troubleshoot it or fix it. You typically have to replace it just plain out replace it but all those tricks are to be had in this production engine you can take a look at the link of what's happening i've been taking a pretty detailed notes of what worked and what didn't on, uh, on the latest build and what i'm going to do right now is for one test the detail print so so one exotic kind of a print you can make is this 3d printed calipers um, uh, Google, uh, not, don't Google it, it's 3D, printer cal 3D printed calipers uh, on the wiki. I'll take a look at that. It's a very detailed kind of a print. And the good thing is that these calipers that you see, so that's these have been, that you see in the picture, have been printed by resin printing, meaning stere the stereolithography. 
meaning resin based laser shoots that it's, it's deemed to be more accurate than filament 3d printing though i've been reading up on that and you can if you get your printer really good and print with a 0.15 nozzle now 0.15 is super tiny the standard is 0.4 millimeters uh, but you can get similar results so i want to push the limits of what we can do with our printer by printing out these calipers and observing how much accuracy do I get actually on the measurements with these calipers. So this guy on Thingiverse got the accuracy of 3D printed calipers to be 2.5 thousands, it's under 100 microns. Uh, one thousandth, well one thousandth is 25 microns, so this is about 60 or so microns accuracy for the measurements you get from these calipers, so that's good. Um, so you can see on a, on a page here, so that's the layout of the print. I'm going to print that probably today uh, and see how how well these work and possibly go, so, so using 0.4 millimeter nozzle, otherwise go to smaller, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep to the 0.4 millimeter since in the current Titan Arrow version, the wall with the volcano heater block, not sure they make volcano nozzles that are that small. I think the smallest volcano nozzle you can get is 0.4 millimeters. So I'll see what we can do with that. And if these calipers don't work, all I need to do is just scale the print size up. Because uh, we are getting into some very fine features. There's very fine, fine teeth on those wheels and all the parts that go into a caliper. So that's, that's kind of like the latest on where I'm at. Uh, basically testing the printer. Uh, yeah, it, the the one report I must I must say is the quality is pretty outstanding actually right now with the uh, the nozzle being so close to the actual car, um, guide rails. Very pleasing results. So I printed just a really tall, like a 10 centimeter tall cube uh, using spiral mode, meaning that you just do the outer contour. And, man, this thing just prints really fast. And the layers are just about just perfect like visually you can <clears throat> you can barely detect any kind of a uh, discrepancy of from away from perfect so but how do you quantify all of that uh, something about that and pot and uh, what I plan on doing is actually using my calipers my 3d printed calipers to get precise measurements on the prints themselves to report on the uh, dimensional accuracy of prints as well as their squareness because you have to be square um, you have to make make sure that the frame is aligned and square when you're printing. So that's that's that. Um, Jonathan Jonathan has been working in the background here. So, um, he's talking about the manufacturing execution system. He's talking about um, looking at a basically a conveyor belt for part printing. Like if you pr print a part, then it could slide off a conveyor belt. There's systems like that that are open source. He has just drawn up a concept. Um, that's the latest where he is and the latest report on the golf cart that's where we are at right now we have troubles with um, <laughs> on the golf cart it's a simple thing simple hydraulic power cube golf cart um, but if you zoom in on the motors there we can't find the couplers for the particular motors that we have so that's a little block we have and we still haven't solved it uh, there's some notes on the open source golf cart page if you want to take a look at it for where we are with that but it was pretty impossible to find these tapered one inch shaft couplers for these motors that have a one inch tapered shaft whereas one and a quarter inch is common we just couldn't find one inch shafts for, for this so that's that's that um, and here just last comment on uh, production engineering um, to wrap up the 3d printer part I was thinking about okay when you ship kits uh, the welding part is definitely a prohibitive part not a lot of people will have welders if we're shipping this out so what do you do so one way to go about it is use corner brackets so 3d printed corner brackets so six uh, eight of them because there are eight corners um, that should work reasonably well I'll test that out with a brand new so I'll build another printer and test a new frame because this one currently here that's welded and it's nice and strong and stiff uh, really good quality prints Let's see what happens when you do the, the corner brackets. And, and we have an advantage there in that the, the carriage, the axes are mounted 
very near the corners, meaning the strongest part of the frame. So we'll see how well that works. And if it doesn't, we might uh, go to plan B, which the plan B for reinforcement would be to make those corner brackets larger. Um, and when I was thinking about that, well, when we have the larger printers, we should be printing a very precise plastic frame. If we want to do that, uh, that's doable too. But uh, metal is going to be better. Like, for example, metal doesn't burn. Not a fire hazard. It will last for a lifetime. Uh, plastic might be, of course, will be weaker. So you have to treat it a different way. Make sure you get enough strength. So there's weldless frame. Uh, so I'm thinking of wire box. Uh, so kind of like tidying up the 3D printer. Uh, right now, I mean, it looks decent, but there is a bunch of wires going to the ramps. And I do want to commit to keeping everything exposed, like an OSE style, meaning that you can repair it yourself or repair it. Like it's easier for you to repair it than actually to send it away to a repairman because everything is transparent. So there's advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, it may not look like such a consumer good but i think we need to stick to that uh, because if we value lifetime design over looks then we would have the structure and components more exposed so i think that's more consistent with osc uh, for lifetime design to prioritize that over looks and and to do the looks you can still do do features but when you when you work on making the thing look pretty don't compromise access to parts that's that's just the principle we want to use uh, make it still very easy to access and fix don't make it a black box like is this you know lots of people do that like i mean just from personal experience take for example the lowell's bot it's a high, highly refined printer but uh, the, the printer I had here, I need to replace. I mean, some fried in electronics, it's a real pain to open everything up and, and even just access to to see what actually went wrong. So uh, we want to make this super turnkey to fix like five minutes and you can replace, swap out any part. Not like a multiple hour job, like it would be standard. Um, so, so the wire box is just a small enclosure next to the controller where we put all the excess wires so any of that hairball that that you have to wrap up in a neat way just stick it all in there don't worry it takes little time it's all hidden from view but you just open the lid and everything is completely accessible other little details um, some interference on the, on the bracket yeah let me just point to one one thing because this was one surprise that I had to negotiate uh, so so on the 3d printer production engineering page uh, if you go I explain this one little point but it's an important one and you can't really see it in a CAD uh, unless you have a really sharp eye to 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 see it but it's actually right there so we could also open up the CAD here. But if you um, take a look at the the CAD, which is a D3D V1902, so that's where you find the CAD. Um, so if you look at, let me zoom in here a little bit. So if you look at, this is the Y axis here y1 so when the carriage goes all the way to the sense step here this purple little thing here like this edge right here like i'll draw that um, this red edge of the y bracket hits the edge of the of the carriage here. So when the carriage moves towards the end stop, um, there's a place where you can get friction there and and have it rub. It's it's because they're like right next to each other. So what you got to do is offset the way this bracket mounts. You got to offset it so that the the y axis here 
is just a little bit away from that bracket so that when the carriage goes in there it doesn't hit so that was just one detail so tiny little details like that beyond that i mean sweet really it was really pleasing to see that the high quality print i'll report more on that once i get some nice pictures of detailed prints so some of the things in production engineering like just to you know, performance benchmarking there's there's like four main main things so there's motion speed there's accuracy of the print there's alignment of the entire machine and then extrusion rate and that's where we we want to make sure we get the proper extrusion rate because if you're going to talk about printing big items like chairs and desks and in wiki house house parts made of plastic wood composites uh, you want a significant extrusion rate the current state of art as i mentioned is 20 pounds per day using the super volcano nozzle from e3d and we actually want to do that with multiple nozzles and possibly make that even larger to more like 30 pounds per day or 15 kilograms per day or so and really push that so if you have multiple nozzles you're spitting out like like a hundred pounds a day so that means you're producing some massive parts um, and people are gonna say oh that's crazy um, that gets into a lot of you know, why don't you like do something else because that takes a lot of energy to print well not really because uh, if you got scrap plastic the cost of the filament the cost of those printed parts are the cost of electricity which runs you like 10 cents per hour uh, so it's actually very affordable like if you're gonna make 3d printing filament the filament costs you about uh, 10 cents per kilogram and that's that's what we've seen here like using our extruder we we can press out a roll of filament in about two hours which is two, uh, two pounds one kilogram so about a uh, and that takes like 200 watt hours or so uh, which is under 10 cents it's less than 10 cents it's, it's it gets affordable but but the deal is if you're using plastic that you buy that costs 20 bucks a pound uh, 20 bucks a kilo rather so you're going from 20 bucks a kilo to like uh, 10 cents a kilo when you make your own plastic so that's when it makes sense to make your own plastic okay um, I think that's it for me just doing uh, just continuing on on a 3d printer and uh, also if you look at some of the recent wiki changes uh there's actually i'll bring out this last thing but but the the power of the universal access system is the um uh, idea of scalability and uh the universal access page has links to the one inch and two inch universal axes and i'm actually starting to look at the two inch and one inch like the one inch uh, it turns out, so the one inch would be a CNC torch table. Like this is a prototype we did last year with one inch shafts. Now, take a look at this. What if we use Marlin? So uh, so, so one of the outstanding issues on the torch table is height control uh, in the condition where you've got a flame, smoke and dust, and warping metal, and you have to control the torch at a given height off the workpiece. And for us, it's oxyacetylene, since that, that's the acce uh, accessible low-tech way to do metal cutting up to very thick steel well what about this use a water table so a water table is uh, basically pool of water under the the work the say the sheet of metal you're running so t water table that's what it's called uh you put a water table on which we have on our older prototype of the torch table use the water table therefore the metal does not warp when you heat it up and, and cut it so that's the reason for a water table the metal doesn't warp um, and the smoke is absorbed into the water and stuff like that but what if you used the 3d printing tool chain which is probing the bed so that means you probe the the metal all over it and as long as that metal does not warp throughout the cut process then you're good and i'm claiming that okay if you have a water table the thing is not gonna warp on you so right now my my approach to solve the the height control issue which otherwise you'd have to use like uh, things like uh, this would be 
what is it uh, IR height sensors infrared no the, the industry standard for doing height control is uh, it's not IR it's like you don't want to do anything that's got visible light or near visible because um, there's light from the cutting flame and there's smoke so that if it's a visible kind of a detector it won't work in, in the messy condition so they use ultrasound typically uh, ultrasound is the high-tech industry standard for torch height control and other people use capacitive height control um, well what if you use our same probe we use on a 3d printer which we already have and just probe the entire sheet of metal with that uh, I don't see why that wouldn't work and under the assumption that the metal is not warping while you're cutting so that could be an easy solution and um, a prototype that will be forthcoming and I want to get it going uh, as soon as I can here so after the 3d printers one of the near-term things are the torch table so that's one e very easy way to do that and hopefully that works then we have to worry about ignition and gas control but uh, that's I think that's uh, conceptually that's a good piece of progress just noticing that you don't need to probe the bed real time under thousand degrees Celsius conditions of metal cutting you know thousand five hundred or two thousand Celsius and smoke and heat and all that so we can probe the bed beforehand okay that's my updates um, and I'd like to move on to other people let's see so Nathan and Abe and John let's see do we have Eric Uh, who's got some updates? Nathan, do you have some updates? Um, uh, yes, I'm mostly, mostly just uh, the, I uh, chatted with Alex about getting a 3D printer, um, and I think I'll be able to get that from him. It seems I'm moving to my place, so hopefully in a week or so. Um, I'll be able to start printing out parts. He said that there's a little tinkering, so I'm going to be um, bugging somebody with questions about how to, uh, about how to get that up and running. Um, Hopefully, he'll be able to point me in the right direction. Um, but, March, I'm, I'm still waiting for feedback on uh, on the uh, 3D printed uh, yeah, uh, I mean, part with, 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 the, with the larger magnets. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I tried sending that to you. I guess you didn't get it. Uh, but, yeah, I printed it out. It looks pretty good, actually. Uh, let's see. Um, I posted that on my Facebook uh, let me boot that up here. What? What did you say? I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe you didn't see it, or I didn't hit send. Um, yeah, it, it's not. It's not in my inbox. Maybe it's in my. Let me, let me, let me try check again here. Um, real quick. Yeah, the best place regarding getting the D3D 1810 up and running, the 3D printer manual is the pretty comprehensive source on that. Okay. So, let's see. Let me see. Uh, so, Nathan. And by the way, I'm still in a, fa in a slow lane here. Tomorrow is the magical day. We get our one gig line tomorrow at 1 p.m. So I'm still on the old line here. Um, and let's see what happened to this email. Looks like it's in my draft. <laughs> That's going to be nice. To have that internet. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be good. Um, Yep, it's in my inbox, so 
Um, it's in my draft box. So, I'm, I just hit sent on that. So, yeah, take a look at that Facebook post. Yeah, I mean, it looks good. Um, no issues with that. The, the test, next test would be to get some magnets and, and actually test it. So, I printed yeah. out one of them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the way it feels and looks, it's it's big enough that if you put in those six millimeter magnets in there, I think it, I think it would work. So, uh, don't see a problem. Okay, great. Cool. And yeah, the email came, just came to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right, I, I went ahead and designed um, and kind of updated all the existing models with, with, that, with those magnet sizes. So, um, I'll upload those to, the, to, to my log and then we can yeah, start putting them together and trying it out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you get some of the six millimeter magnets? Do you have access to those, or or do you have any? Yeah, uh, yeah, they, they arrived. They arrived on Sunday. Um, I'll just need to, yeah, uh, just just need to figure out where to where to get a printer. Um, but that's probably not going to happen until next week, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um. That sounds good. So yeah, we can start getting these tested, and uh, Great. So we can put some meaningful structures together with them. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, let's see, Abe, do you have an update? See the meeting? I don't see him. Oh, did they pop off? Okay. I guess so. Um, yeah. Uh, Eric, do you have any updates? Hi. Um, do I sound okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, been pretty busy trying to get that uh, the D3D uh, working. Um, so. Several good prints, um, you know, then something kind of breaks, but I think uh, it's operational now. I uh, change out the MOSFET, um, and so I think some of those connectors um, for the power supply and such, where they're carrying a lot of current, um, connectors are kind of important on that. I had some wires touching plastic and causing melts and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think it's operational, and I'm um, gonna test it again today. Printed that rocket push like six times now, <laughs> so yeah. trying to um, get into an extruder for the volcano. Yeah, you have the MOSFET for the bed, right? Yeah. Do you have the wires soldered on the back of your your uh, your ramps? Or uh, I don't think the wires are soldered onto the back. You got the four, uh, four plug connector. Yeah. Yeah. What I do, if it's, uh, yeah, what I do is solder the leftmost two wires on the back so they're not going through the connector. Okay. That's what I've been doing these days. So the power to the ramps, um, it's only doing the extruder heater, but that will i've seen that in one case like as soon as it happened once i just started soldering them on the back but um uh, for me right now when i make a kit i soldered those on the back and the other two right ones i plug into the the plug okay yeah and also like i don't like those like i started using solid core wire there because the stranded wire it tends to break off after you you do the ends it's kind of weak, so if you want to firm that up, yeah, that's that's what I would recommend. But the cool thing is, um, so right now what I'm going to do here, I have, I've been thinking about the scalable 
heater block because I mentioned last week that that the super volcano is hundred fifty dollars just for the heater block I mean that's how much you can get a cheap Chinese printer for so uh, so how about we take a couple of volcano blocks use a super volcano nozzle and put two of those blocks on a super volcano nozzle and the nozzle itself costs like thirteen dollars uh, it's a long one it's about forty or fifty about fifty millimeters long for that threaded part you can thread on two heater blocks on that so i'm going to try that here and therefore for like five bucks you can have the equivalent performance of a hundred fifty dollar uh heater block because they just don't make a lot of them and the thing is when you when you buy larger parts larger dedicated parts they get very expensive because not a lot of people use them like right now i i, I don't think a lot of people are using the super super volcano but if you want to do any significant printing we definitely want to do it a super volcano and larger so we'll press some limits on that so that lends yeah. itself to to being done with the printers that we have if you have a volcano nozzle you can uh, uh put a, two of them on but then you'd have to direct the cooling fan differently so yeah just tweaks like that yeah i'll get more into the extruder design as um i don't mind from scratch yeah. um yeah, so this was to uh, um, have this at an expo in two weeks. Um, so it's been a good deadline to get me working on it, get it working. Um, what is two weeks from now? The MSU Expo. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I'm thinking a little bit how to move um, the printer around and uh, looking at getting just a box to carry it around in. Um, but yeah, just trying to reinforce everything so that I don't like to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then kind of stuff that's more um, my interest. Uh, so the the peer to peer plasmid. I have a I have a page on the wiki, um, kind of just talking about my ideas. So I'm um, gonna make a the combinant DNA marketplace on a blockchain. So they're having a blockchain event here this weekend, and we're going to discuss um, some different ideas. Um, it's not explicitly open source, but um, we'll see if uh, anyone's interested in developing my particular idea, which we try to keep open source. Um, and then, yeah, I think I'm going to take the printer around um, this this summer to a few uh, events and festivals. So I'll kind of put a page off on that. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, this weekend um, I'm actually going off to the. It's called the Midwest Rep Rap Festival. That's that's coming up this Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I'll be there. Um, anyone going there? <laughs> Eric, I guess it's close. It's close to you. Uh, it's Where eight hours. It? It's an eight dri hour drive for me here. Um, but yeah, that should be really exciting to just to get the latest and greatest on all the all the three D printer people are going to be there. It's um, it's an international thing, so I'll look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, let's see. Otherwise, um, Okay, looks like Abe is working on connectors for the plastic version and things like of the 3D printer with inserts, <clears throat> ones that insert into a PVC pipe, not go around the PVC pipe, but that, but that go inside. So that's that's interesting. Um, okay, well I think that's that's about it for now. Then if um, we've gone through everybody's report. So, yeah, I think we can leave it here, and um, I want to get my, the printer, like the, the production engineering part, really ready for shipping so we can offer kits on a regular basis and just have that as a product that's, that's there um, in the background as I continue on the book and getting ready for the, the next massive flurry of development. Yeah, I think that the book is going to be very important for that. So... Uh, but at the same time, I want to have the 3D printer enterprise as a model that's actually working in the background 
that's providing revenue for bootstrap funding to bring more people onto the project. So that's that's a very important part and proof of concept. And uh, also continuing with the, the development of the the Hero X the, or the I don't know if we're going to do Hero X, but the incentive challenge on the cordless drill, which is right now the, the current plan, to show that there could be a really excellent viable business uh, where we get a lot of people producing these cordless drills around the world and actually working with major supply chains. Uh, not supply chains, but but stores. Uh, getting this into stores to um, is a potential clear case of showing that open source can really work in a case of goods that can be made at a prof pretty much professional grade level. Uh, so we'll continue doing that. That's uh, meeting with my um, mentor on that. I'm uh, basically marketing mentor. Um, so we're really discussing the business strategy be be behind how that could happen. So, so uh, they'll take uh, a few months of development. And otherwise, uh, moving forward on getting the printer out as kits that are ready for others to build. Martin, when do you hope to have the book finished? Uh, sorry. Oh, uh, I, I said, when do you have hope to have the book finished? By? Yeah, that's going to be. That's going to be a long-term project. It's it's more on a one-year time scale. Uh, so it's really about communicating all the learnings, including um, like all the learnings about design principles, like the design mm -hmm. guides of how we design all the different things. Because because in-house we've had experience on everything from housing to agriculture to 3D printers, torch tables. I mean, there's mm -hmm. all your utility systems for housing, house construction itself. Um, there's some some electronics microcontrollers so there's uh, and there's a lot of techniques that once you get a handle on enough of that you can be be decent at, at starting to to work on new designs uh, and yeah. I think that's really critical to to get people around some of the basic tool sets and skill sets around distributed manufacturing so that's it's a definite promised land that hasn't been delivered yet like um, you know there's been the talk of the amazing power of distributed production with 3d printers and everything else it's kind of emerging slowly and surely but um, um, believe it or not I mean not too much open source activity is going on so that so we really need to help that along and I think uh, communicating all this the design knowledge will be part of the book so so it's like on one side it's the big perspective of, about, okay, what are some pressing world issues? And then how does uh, the solution of ending artificial scarcity or, or making production abundant and plentiful for everybody and accessible to everybody as a core um, of a sound economy, like how do you, how do, you do all of that? So yeah. the book will be positioned more like a, uh, it's like a action guide. It's, it's like a, it would really be, not for people who want to just read it and feel good or like get inspired by it, but but really more about the people who are going to be doing that and taking on these skills to do this. So because there's different ways to do it, you can do a a book where it's like, oh yeah, you can tell the big story, but really give people no tools to do anything about it. Well, here it's it's really everything about um, providing the tools to get people involved, and there's so much, and it's it's really about educating a lot of people, but. Yeah, to put it all together is going to take a bit of time, and and in the process, I also want to interview a lot of different people, the leading leading experts in in cutting edge work and all kinds of open source and related uh, material, like from Wikipedia to other hardware projects, everything else, where we learn, you know, tr truly try to build upon what's what's been discovered already to take it to the next step for what open hardware could be. Because I mean, right now, yeah, it's just not happening. Like open hardware. I could say, you know, from being in it over the last decade, it's just not happening. Like I would say, like ten years ago, maybe uh, 2012 or so, there's a lot of lot of hustle and bustle around it. Uh, I think it's kind of died off in, in many different ways. It's alive, but it's not. It certainly hasn't delivered the kind of promise it could. So uh, yeah. I definitely want to make a contribution to 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 a solid effort on that on that. Uh, mm -hmm. face uh, and speaking of which uh, Dave Hackens who's one of the good open source warriors out there on precious plastic he did this new he's starting a new thing called one army um, 
Dave Hackins. Let's Google that. I just got an email from him the other day. Yeah, One Army on YouTube, and he has o OSC in there with uh, one of our tractors in there as one of the showcases. But take a look at this little video on One Army. coming together is about yeah, yeah I'll leave you with that so uh, I'm gonna paste that in the chat chat box because that's inspiring work I think Dave is on track he's always talking open source whereas I, I'm seeing a lot of people that go by the wayside <laughs> including just an email today um, you know the open source beehives guys um, uh, so Aaron who was here a long time ago he told me that oh from now on all their stuff is gonna be proprietary you know it happens all the time when when somebody it's it's just the reality it's kind of a sad thing but there's everyone's going under in an open source world like <laughs> it's it's not taking off so we definitely got to do something about it but but it's alive it's going to happen but i i think we're still somewhat in the dark ages of hardware and for the reason like just to go historically back just to wrap up on this uh the way open software was different is that open software started with open culture uh, people who started it knew open source and then it became proprietary now it's open source is the default industry standard whereas for hardware we have 200 years of industrial inertia 200 years of patents it started very proprietary yeah. and it's still very proprietary and nobody can think that it can be otherwise and that's one of the big yeah. challenges for open hardware right now uh, which if you kind of like look at the history um, I've talked to several people about that, and, and it seems to be the consensus that it's that it's a historical, a kind of a cultural evolution. It's like open hardware. No, it's not in consciousness because of 200 years of history, and that's that's what we're working against right now. Um, mm -hmm. And it's definitely like I, I see it in, in how you know a lot of people approach me, but I mean very very few people are really get the get the tenants and see the promise of it so yeah it's we're still kind of in a stone age of uh hardware whereas it's completely opposite on software though right. in software at this point it's like you don't need the ethics even because it's just practical you know mm -hmm. so so software in some way uh kind of missed the ethical route for a lot of a lot of people software you go open source because it just makes business sense and you're crazy if, if you don't do it because other people are going to have better software than you if you don't contribute to open source projects. If you try to do it on your own, you're too, it's too expensive. Um, but for hardware, yeah, people have a hard time wrapping their mind around um, that. So there's the ethical um, ethical part. I don't know. How, how is open hardware going to turn out? I mean, hopefully that... Uh, we have a revolution in how people treat it ethically, but but it could also turn out that like software, where it's just a practical thing. So for a lot of people, it might be practical, but I hope that enough of the effort around open hardware uh, it changes people's lives in such a fundamental way that uh, the ethics of open collaboration actually become very transparent to everybody. Whereas for software, it's like you know, it's not like it may not be tangible enough for the ethics to translate to people's lives, but with hardware, I think there's a, you know, there's a bigger chance because it's meeting real tangible needs of people uh, is more close yeah. to people's psychology. So we'll we'll see how it goes, but definitely, uh, you know, where we stand, and and part of that is like Debian has the Debian social contract. Uh, that's one of the seminal open source projects and software. Debian is. Um, I'm going to write that contract for OSC2. It's kind of like implicit in what we do and on the wiki, but I'm going to write, okay, this is our contract. This is this is what we're promising to the world, and that is to be absolutely open source, and that's how you can, that's the only way you can end the military economy by, by being collaborative. So we're going to make that all explicit. And it's part of that messaging that has to get out there uh, for people to pick up a new way of thinking. But that's where we are right now. Um, and definitely exciting times ahead so let's keep going okay so i think i'll wrap up here and uh, we'll go from here so yeah continue let's keep going and we'll see you then again next week great thank you okay thanks a lot everybody